I would like to talk uh, to um, uh, Amir about two things, Amir. Uh, is, is there a correlation between the culture and the accountability? I think probably the President, Honorable President of Pakistan talked about conscious, um, consciousness, and obviously he also talked about uh, the, the culture getting associated with the consciousness, the general consciousness of people. Or subs the most important thing is that, you know, if you do not have a culture which is an inclusive and a pervasive culture, then it can create problems at any point in time. And in fact, uh, even if you are having hundreds and thousands of control and data points, you would probably not be able to um, you navigate them for the right compliance culture within an institution. Uh, so with, in that context, uh, generally, what's your suggestions to the banking industry, Amir? Um, how do we uh, you know, sort of integrate the compliance with businesses? That's one part of the question. And also, um, how do we ensure that the right kind of compliance culture and more probably more robust set of accountabilities and framework of responsibilities and accountabilities get created within the institution, which is what we theoretically call as a RC, RSEI metrics. So what are your views on that and specifically within Bank Islami, have you, is, is there something that you feel that you could be able to share as a success story for uh, the consumption of the audience? Uh, thank you. So uh, I think uh, to answer a question, uh, the most relevant thing is uh, I will try to share what we have done at Bank Islami uh, during the last uh, few years. So uh, first thing which we did uh, about creating a culture that we decided to start every meeting in Bank Islami uh, with a compliance talk, uh, which is do, do your tilawat and do a compliance talk. And that I adopted from my shell days. We used to start our meeting with safety talks because we used to deal with oil, which is very combustible. So we used to start our meetings with safety talks. So we said we are dealing with money, uh, which can be a dirty money, which, need, which can be laundered through our system. So we need to build up a culture, which is, which is the most hazardous things which we are dealing as a banker is uh, the, dirty, the possibility of dealing with dirty money. So let's start every single meeting with compliance talks. So we started building that culture. And every meeting I used to chair, I start that meeting with a compliance talk. Every other meeting which my colleagues used to chair, they used to start their meeting with a compliance talk. So we started building a culture. So initially people were, I think, um, thinking that this culture will go away and this is something which we are doing uh, just for a temporary period of time. But when we started doing it for con on a consistent basis, then all our colleagues who were working outside those control functions like audit, compliance, risks, so they started believing that this is something which is integral part of the business. So it's not something uh, which is uh, a cost on them or which is something which is imposed on them to tax them. So they started believing it is something which we do, which is part of banking. So we started with that. After that, the second thing was, uh, as a couple of other colleagues and Aurangzeb Sahib also mentioned, was, was about the KYC. So we decided that we will do, we will do the KYC a fresh of all our customers. So we, uh, there was two models. A, we, we, were, we were moving to a new system for our KYC and uh, CDD and EDD models. So we, the one model was the IT had said, okay, we'll transfer the data from our old system to the new system. So it will be a data migration technique and we will be compliant. I said, no, let's take a hard route. We will do a KYC of every single customer again. So we started doing that. It took us almost uh, one and a half year. And it was an exercise when we used to start our management meeting every week. We used to start with that statistics, uh, area by area and region by region, checking how many uh, KYCs has been performed of the existing customers by the branches, how many of these have been reviewed by the centralized account opening uh, team and the compliance team. And every week, we used to have an accountability on that. We started building a reward model around that as well, that look, it will be something if you achieve faster, uh, it will be rewarded. So that really worked. Initially, uh, everybody, everybody thought that this is something which is not needed. We can easily transfer data from one system to another, but it was my, my resolve that we have to do it again so that we actually know every single customer uh, afresh. So that was the second thing which at Bank Slami we did. And then when we did those two things, uh, although these seems to be more procedural, but they have a very pervasive impact on the culture. 
because when we were doing it we needed to have more people working in compliance so a compliance team which then probably uh, was a team of roughly 10 people grew from 10 people to 70 people uh, considering the size of bank slami so then the people then the people working the business started believing that there is a culture of investing into uh, this function as well uh, we invested a lot into training that every week there should be a training uh, of uh, the AML laws, uh, KYC, CDD laws, and I used to personally get connected with the trainer on those weekends. And initially, frankly, uh, there was a situation that 25 people were invited and I got a call from the trainer saying, or a message on Saturday morning, saying that, sir, there are only seven people in the room in Multan. And then I had to call all the senior management everywhere sitting in the region and in the Multan area. And then people started rushing in because they were, they were feeling that someone sitting at the top is following them, these, these training up. So these, these trainings are no more just tick box or uh, means something like you send anybody uh, from your team uh, who is not doing anything so that there is a, uh, there is a tick, tick on the number of people who have attended the training. So that's entirely transformed the culture of the bank. And then we give a lot of authority to our compliance team. Uh, there, there were situations that I, because I also uh, came out from a business function, I started my banking in a business function uh, and worked all through in a business function. So I used to get calls from my colleagues working in the business telling that, look, there is a deposit, the compliance team is not opening this account. I used to personally sit down with the compliance team to understand the intricacies of that account. And at number of times we solved those problems and we helped the business team, but the number of times we told them very clearly, look, I have personally seen it, every single document, probably you have not seen it, and it is not doable. So I'm not saying that there is a need to do micromanagement on a consistent basis, that some samples or actions of micromanagement led the people to believe that this is important. So the creating a culture it can be created, you cannot create a culture by talking only, you have to walk the talk. So generally, uh, what is the problem with our society is we try to create a culture only by giving a lecture. Mm. So lectures don't create cultures, actions create cultures. So we started taking actions and that worked at Bank Slami, uh, Alhamdulillah. So one Excellent. most important thing which personally I also learned uh, after getting engaged in this piece of the work was that our understanding of money laundering is very limited, generally even as a banker and I would say as business community is non-existent. <coughs> because when somebody walks into your bank and you ask him or her about uh, his sources of income, his expenses, his outflows and inflows, he or she believes that this is my personal space, how a banker can ask these questions. Mm. And this is still prevalent. Sometimes people complain that it takes months or weeks to open an account, but half of the issue created because of those months and weeks that people say, look, I have opened an account 20 years ago in X bank and now I'm here again to open another account after 20 years. And 20 years ago, that bank never asked me any question. So why are you asking any question? And I have an expired trust deed. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, change that trust deed for you. And I, I'm not going to update it to include the signatories. So then it takes a lot of time. Then bankers should ideally have a right to say no. Mm -hmm. uh, but to date, I have, I have felt that there are two competing forces uh, which are rightly competing with each other. But the issue is that there is a culture being developed on one side of the, of the continuum and the, and the culture is missing on the other side of the continuum. Like in the business community, the culture of compliance and uh, the understanding of money laundering is non-existent. Mm -hmm. And when I initially used to think that the money laundering law is only applicable on banks, then later I learned it's applicable on every single citizen of Pakistan. So the Man Anti Money Laundering Act is not restrictive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually uh, it's actually applicable on everybody. So the state bank regulations can be only applicable on banks. But the understanding of people on anti money laundering laws is very limited. The understanding of journal public about money laundering is that the money on which they have evaded tax is a black money and if you can and if you wash that money then it's laundering but actually uh, tax evasion is only one crime 
which which leads to any anti money laundering situations there are many other predicate offenses which lead to a money laundering situation so there is a need to create awareness among general public and mm. businesses telling them look the these steps of due diligence which a bank art is taking is to protect you now people have learned that they will not share their id card copy without crossing it because they know it can be misused now people don't share yeah, their mobile yeah. sims with each other <clears throat> so because people have understood it what are the repercussions of doing that now people have have stopped selling they have vehicles uh, without getting those transferred in the name of new buyers earlier i remember from my childhood days we bought a car which was owned by somebody 15 14 years ago and then one day we have to transfer it then we realize that there are 14 buyers or 10 buyers in between the car has changed hand now the culture is changing on that side but this awareness i think there is a need to create awareness just like cyber crime awareness mm. which we are creating on the anti money laundering laws that yeah. look these this the money is either <coughs> originating from a crime that crime can be a robbery mm. that crime be, can be a some other form of uh, 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 activity which is uh, which is harming the society or that money can be used for another crime mm. which can be a terrorist activity so yeah. once we create that awareness then the culture on the other side will also develop and then this friction uh, which is uh, existing between that the customer wants an account to be opened without telling anything in 30 seconds and the banks want to do complete due diligence so i think this friction will continue unless both parties are able to understand the benefits of uh, these practices which are which are there to actually control crime so actually mm. if you look at bank's role uh, frankly uh, the bank should not have any role uh, in doing uh, in stopping these crimes mm. because banks are not law enforcement agencies but because every crime is either motivated for financial uh, reasons or there is a crime for which you need financing so yeah. this is a conduit and the banks have been given this responsibility which the banks now probably has voluntarily accepted as well we are not being paid for doing that frankly yeah. because we have to pay the cost of this uh, activity out of our own <coughs> earnings but now the banks have voluntarily accepted it because it's built into the culture now <laughs> so so the reason is now the banks as a social, as a citizen of this society as a part of this society have understood that we as an artificial juridical person has to do a role has to play a role to stop the crime when we we when we monitor all these financial transactions we will be able to help the law enforcement agencies to red flag those transactions look probably this appears to be the proceeds of a crime <clears throat> so that the law enforcement agency can backtrack and then can take actions as per law sure. or the proceeds are being used which is even more dangerous for some form of crime which can be a terrorist activity so if banks have accepted this responsibility now there is a need for the public uh, mm. at large to understand that responsibility and before uh, enabling before asking the public to understand it is more important for businesses to understand that responsibility yes, yes. so yes. this is my point of view on the creating a culture and then all the controls which are being built they cannot be uh, the uh, i won't yeah. say we as as uh, auditors and accountants says that no controls give you a, 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 a an assurance which is a complete assurance It only give you a reasonable assurance so these controls will only give you a reason available assurance mm -hmm. but unless you create a culture even these controls will not be able to i would say give that reasonable assurance which we expect from that sure. so culture is paramount and for sure. culture we need to take actions rather than just relying on talks and lectures thank you very much uh, uh, amir i think you have very categorically summarized it in a way that culture is the sum of a small deeds happening over time and